in the movie ever was in the butler. The when the butler's son was in the room with King and King was telling him the importance of having the butler in the White House. See, we forget that it's very important to have one of us in there at all times. Now, think about this. Think about all the, the stuff that she's putting out on Trump that if she wasn't there, we never would even know. And thank God she recorded because if she didn't record, nobody would have believed her. So if she was really a complete sellout, would she be even putting this out right now? She could have took over. She could have took the hundred eighty thousand dollars a year job and not done nothing. Um, I will tell you this though. All right, so I have the book right here in front of me, for everybody, and this is a must-read book, whether you like her or not. It is a lot of great information in this book about what's really going on in that White House. And this is why when people say, well, she's a sellout. Well, she's given a lot of information that we wouldn't know if she wasn't in that White House. And she could have easily just kept her mouth shut. But she says in the book that, you know, it started with the Charlottesville thing, 15-year run out of this. If you listen with an open mind, you may actually be surprised. You may be very surprised at what you hear. So we always have to have somebody that's connected to that White House who's looking, who's paying attention. And so I'm just asking you to be open-minded, look at it from, from all angles, from both sides, from, from, from all, the, all the circles, because it's more to it than meets the eye. And the book, like I said, the book has so much good information in it. Look, I couldn't put the book down once I started reading it. It, it, it is a must-read book. You should, you should buy this book whether you like her or dislike her. The book is a must-read book. Do we have Amarosa? Good morning. Yes, good morning. What's up, Lady O? I am so sorry. My flight, my flight was delayed, so I just landed and I got on. So if you hear well, the announcement in the back, just ignore it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and, and thank you so much for doing this, as always. You know, I was just telling people about, look, I got your book. I couldn't put it down. Could not put it down. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Thank it's so you. much in this book that I that I thought I knew that I didn't know. And so I'm telling people, hey, you should buy this book no matter what. Now, we're almost up against a commercial break. So what I want to do is just I want to ask you one question and then we'll finish up because I know you, you you get limited time. But the first question I want to ask you is this. Everybody. Lauren, first of all, I have a, all the time in the world for you. So uh, uh, if we don't even get finished up today. I'll call Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We are friends. Yes. So I apologize that I was delayed on my flight. And it's no worries about that at all. You know, I ain't got number love for you. I even told the audience, I said, look, I'm going to be completely transparent with y'all. This is my girl. I, I love this girl. She is my, <laughs> she, this is my girl. I'm, I'm, I'm down for her. So, hey, I'm, I'm letting y'all know that from the rip. I'm letting you know that for the, for the rip. So they was like, well, one, I said, nah, I, I, I said, I'm just going to be honest with y'all. I said, because I know the real person. I, I'm not talking about the TV person y'all see. I know what she's done for, for young ladies at Howard, what she did with her ministry, what she did with her magazine. I know the work that you're doing. So I'm, I'm not going to let people just say, well, no, nah, no, nah, I'm a roast to this. I'm a roast. No, nah, no, nope. I know the real person. So let me, <laughs> let, let, let me, let me tell you about the real person. So let me ask you this for the very first question. All right. Everybody wants to talk about how Trump made you, how he helped you, how he, he, he made you a household name. I completely disagree with that. In fact, I'm going to say something different. And I think you may say, Warren, you're right. I believe you made Trump mainstream because if not for you in that first season of Apprentice, nobody would have watched Apprentice. You were the reason everybody was tuning in. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Well, first of all, thank you. First of all, thanks for having me on. Um, I, first of all, I have to just acknowledge that had I not been cast on The Apprentice, I would have not had a chance to meet you and travel the world. But I do think it's very interesting that he's tried to take credit for everything that has happened in my adult life, because that's just not the case. This was my big break, but you can get your foot in the door, but you got to kick it open and right. stay there. Right. Right. And that's why I want people the to understand. The Apprentice was my Go ahead. Apprentice was my foot in the door, but I've been kicking doors down since 2004. 
Exactly. And that's why I want people to realize, because he keeps trying to make it seem like he's the one who did something for you. I, I, I think you helped him a lot, too. And I think this is the reason he kept bringing you back, because he knew with you on the show, ratings were coming. Yeah, I agree. Definitely agree. Now, you know, I, I was reading the book, and, and I want to talk a little bit about HBCUs, because they're near and dear to both of us. And I was shocked by... Uh, the Secretary of Education, you got something in here about divorce uh, when, when the kids were booing her at, at um, Bethune-Cookman and, and she was talking about they just, they don't have the, the mindset to understand her. I mean, could you, could, could you explain that a little bit more? Well, yeah, we went down, she got invited to deliver the commencement address and the Department of Education asked me to accompany her because, you know, we're sending this white woman down to the HBCU and she didn't understand the culture. As soon as she got up, they started booing so loud and turning their back on her. And I'm like trying to give her the sign to kind of wrap it up. Don't keep going. She continued for 20 more minutes. And then afterwards, she tried to convince me that she had just given the best speech of her life and that it wasn't her that didn't get the culture. It was the students who missed the mark. And I just looked at her like she, you know, the president calls her Ditsy DeVos. She is worse than Ditsy DeVos. She's dangerous. Yeah, I think she is very dangerous, and she really spoke in a very demeaning way about the students at the HBCU, particularly at Bethune-Cookman. And I was very surprised about it, but I realized that this is a white woman who comes from a position of white privilege. And so when she spoke, because she's so extremely wealthy, I don't think she could connect in any way with the students. Mm -hmm. And so I just tried to help her understand she missed the mark. Her policies weren't welcome, and she should have wrapped it up as simple as that. Now, you said something very important right there. You said she came from privilege and she had all this wealth. Let me ask you something about the president. Does he, what does he really, how does he consider, he considers himself to be part of the 1%. So what is his true thoughts about his constituents, the poor, the minorities? What's his true feelings? And is there any, you had all these tapes. Is there any tapes on that? I, I think that he uses, People. Everybody is is an obstacle of his master plan. And so he uses people to that end to accomplish whatever he's trying to accomplish at that moment. And I remember him saying during the, I love the uneducated because the day people who had less education voted for him. And so it's utilitarian. It's any, you know, like care. All right, we are back live. We have Amarosa back on the phone, y'all. We're in a much better spot. You know, I've been there. I've hopped off a plane doing an interview and your phone signal all over the place. You know, <laughs> I, I, I've been there, done that, so I completely understand it. Now, lady, oh, this this is one of the questions I got from, from the book, reading the book, that I had to go back and reread this twice because I was like, what in the hell is really going on? But I got to ask you this. According to the book, <laughs> This man doesn't read any of the legislation, not even the stuff that he's doing executive orders on. He's only getting talking points from aides. Who's really running the White House? Yeah, that's one of the most alarming things about Donald Trump is he's not a big reader. He can get a summary. He can process a summary. He can understand things to an extent if you break it down for him. But he's not a big reader. And so Stephen Miller... John Kelly, uh, Andrew Grimberg, you know, a lot of the folks in domestic policy, but Donald Trump is not making the shot, calling the shot. They make him think he's in charge, but he's not. Now, as, as, a, as somebody who's worked in a previous administration in the White House, as somebody who's highly educated, highly informed, I have to ask this question, too, based on what I'm reading in the book. When you were in these meetings, these high-level meetings with these people, did they value your opinion on this stuff? Well, it's so, so interesting. Whenever they got into a bind, you know, whenever they were faced with some criticism for him insulting an African-American athlete or legislator, they would turn to me in those crisis situations. But there were other situations that dealt with, um, you know, people from all over the world, not just people of color, where I would try to contribute my input and they would ignore me. So the only time they really wanted to utilize my expertise is when it came to African-Americans, almost like I was the African-American translator. Um, and then other times, um, for instance, when we were talking about infrastructure, a tax bill or 
telecommunications, which I happen to have my focus in and my doctorate, they were very dismissive. But I am not the only per- black woman in America who's had to sit at a table with all white men and try to fight to get their voice heard. It's so funny. It's how we deal with it. I think as African Americans, how we've learned to communicate in those meetings, how we've learned to communicate on emails, where we have to say, per my previous conversation, right, <laughs> right, you know, just so that you can always cover your back. Um, it's almost like I create a whole separate language to communicate with my colleagues in the White House because it was constantly this back and forth about them trying to invalidate what I said or how I positioned things. And so that was a very interesting dilemma for me throughout that time. Let me ask you this, too. Now, I I know that Fox News usually rides hard for the Republican Party, but even George W. Bush isn't getting all the protection and all the uh, insulation that this president is getting with Fox. What is the real deal with him and Fox News? Why is this relationship this way? It's very clear that uh, Donald Trump is in bed with Fox News or Fox News is in bed with Donald Trump. I think that they were so excited to get a Republican president that could carry out their agenda that they threw out all concepts of what's right and wrong. Their integrity went out the window when Donald Trump became president. I mean, the connection between Fox News and the campaign was direct. In fact, I talked about it in my book, how we would get talking points from producers at Fox News. And then most recently, um, he hired Bill Shine, who used to be VP at Fox News right. come over and be communications director. So now we don't have to worry about a producer sending us talking points when you have a vice president from Fox News designing the communication messaging strategy for the White House. Do you do you believe while you was in that White House, do, do you believe that at some point you had an epiphany and realized, you know what, this isn't right? Did you ever have that moment in the White House where it's like, this isn't right. I, I, I need to really think about getting out of here. Well, I had a ton of those epiphanies. I had one very early on in February when Donald Trump thought Frederick Douglass was still alive. Right. Oh, that. my goodness. I took him to the African American. <laughs> goodness. When I took him to the African American Museum and he started talking about the bombings in Jewish community centers instead of focusing on the issues in the black community. There were a ton of moments you know, throughout that time that alarmed me. But you know what alarmed me most was that I was sitting around a table with people making decisions about us without us. And so had I left, there would still be no one there to advocate and fight for those things. And so my concern was trying to find somebody to serve as a deputy so I could train them and they could take my position in the event that I was leaving. Now, you said you, and see, this is the same thing that I kind of said uh Prior to you coming on, I said, look, it was very important for her to be in that White House because we always need somebody at the table. Always. No matter what administration it is, we need somebody at the table that's advocating for the people. Do you think you could have done more while you were sitting at the table? I think I could have done more if I had a staff. I think people will be surprised to discover that in Barack Obama's administration, Valerie Jarrett had 14 people working on African-American outreach. In Donald Trump's administration, there was just one person. I had an assistant. She was blonde hair and blue eyed. <laughs> it was just me. And I did everything I could humanly pop do possible as solo in a predominantly, literally a lily white white house. And so, yes, there's a million things I can list to you that I wish that I could have accomplished. But I understand my human constraints of being able to only do what I could humanly do possible in 10 to 15 hour days, which were about how long my days were. Now, let me ask you this, too. With all this stuff going on about what happened with the campaign and the collusion with Russia and all this other stuff, how does how does Pence fit into this? Was was he part of this, too, or or was he in not in the loop? Sorry. Uh, You know, Pence is, I write so openly about Pence being the most terrifying force because the truth of the matter is Donald Trump more likely will be impeached and then we're going to end up with Pence. And Pence is so diabolical and evil because he leverages, he tries to leverage the evangelical community and faith and tries to weaponize that in his policy decisions. I mean, some of the stuff, you know, 
you know, not to take up the whole interview, but it could about um, the, the things that he thinks he can control in women's bodies. Wow. His decisions about whether or not women can, yeah, just basic health care needs for women. He cut funding for. He, um, I, mean, I mean, this man has made some of the most shocking statements that he thought once he got into the White House, people would forget. And I, I never forget. First of all, I researched him when we were considering him as VP. And I told Donald that I didn't think he would be a good VP choice. Um, but we had a, a whole crop of really bad choices for VP. So he was the lesser of the evil. But I would be very concerned if he became president as well. So we're just, we're so, kind of jacked up all the so, way. So, so, so wait, <laughs> let, let me ask you something. So, so did Trump not want Pence? Well, you know, Trump, Trump wanted, there were three candidates that he settled on, and ultimately it was Paul Ryan and the members of Congress on the Hill who felt like Pence could bring in a calming kind of effect on Donald. He was an experienced legislator, and he was a conservative, you know, an extreme original conservative and evangelical. So they thought he'll bring a moral compass, he will bring all of this experience, and he'll be great. Who's more dangerous? Unfortunately, as we've seen... Who's more dangerous? One more time. Who's more dangerous, Pence or Trump, as president, in your opinion? You know, I've been very clear that I think Pence is more dangerous because Pence knows exactly how diabolical he is. Trump is dangerous because he's dumb. Pence (laughs) is dangerous because he's way too smart, you know? Oh, my goodness. Trump is dangerous because he's dumb. Let, let, <laughs> that's the best line ever. I got to tell you that. Let, let me ask you this. You said that you think he's going to be impeached. Why do you think he's going to be impeached? Is there something else out there? Is there more women out there? Is there more? Well, there's more women. I, I've talked about the women. You know, I, I think, you know, I worked for his bestie, uh, David Pecker, for two years right. at AMI, the company that right. owns the Inquirer. And so I saw a lot of things. I heard a lot of things. The stuff that you see on the surface you know, it's just the beginning of the unraveling of his corruption. And, you know, once you get a special prosecutor, as I witnessed when I was in the Clinton White House with Ken Starr, once you get a special prosecutor, yeah. once they start those investigations, they go down all kinds of little dark alleys and tunnels and they find everything horrible you've ever done in life. What do you think is going to be in the safe? That Mueller... What do you think is going to be in the safe that, that Pecker has? What, what do you think is going to be in that safe? <laughs> Women, um, corruption, uh, mob behavior, probably, he probably murdered a couple people we wouldn't even know. You know, just use your imagination when it comes to him. Do you think he's got any connections? You've been around for 15 years. He's from New York. He does construction. Does he have any connections to the mob or anything like that? Is he friends with any of them? Oh, yeah, there's a wonderful book. Oh, yeah, there's a wonderful book that talks about his connections and how he got into Atlantic City with his casinos and how he utilized his mob connections to break into that really tight-knit circle of casino gambling. And all of that was through his mob connection. Wow. Wow. Now, see, yeah. th- this is why I'm telling everybody, look, let's remove the fact that this is my friend. This book will make you do a double take. I promise y'all that. Go get this book. It's, it is a... It's a book that's worth having a book club reading over because it's going to make you ask questions that you never thought you would be asking. You'll be like, what the hell? What is really going on? You know, like I said, I was blown away when I read in there about him not reading the legislation and him just getting talking points because it makes me say, well, who's really controlling the White House? Who's really putting this stuff out yeah, here? Who's running things? Well, I don't know if you heard, Warren, the, in the um, tape that I played of John Kelly, you know, him firing me in the situation room. And then after that, I called, I got a call from Donald and Donald said, Oh, they run a big operation. I didn't know. What yeah. Was going I heard on. that. I, I heard it. That he, I think that people should have been concerned that all this is happening in the white house. And Donald claims not to know that any of this is happening. Well, he kept saying they run a big operation. I'm going, Oh my gosh, he's being puppeted and he has no idea what's happening. Do you think that he's going to end up causing us to go to war because of what he's doing uh, with foreign issues with North Korea, with China, with Russia? Uh, and is there any, in your opinion, do you think there's going to be a tape or a video that comes out that proves that he's actually working or been compromised by Russia? Oh, uh, 
I think um, that Donald has left a, uh, this crumb trail so that Mueller will be able to expose all of those types of things. But I also think that it's important to ask the question, you know, what is he hiding when he's protecting with this Russia, this Trump Tower Russia meeting? I happen to believe, and, you know, you can check me if I'm wrong, that he may be trying to protect Don Jr. Yeah, I agree with that. Himself out there and ultimately. Yeah, and I ultimately think it's going to not end well. I think that the reason he started lying was because he wants to protect his children like any parent would. Right. But that in his desire to protect his family, he's gotten himself even deeper into mess. Let me ask you this, too. You know, and, and this is really, this is just your friend asking the question right here, to be honest with you. After all the book tour, after everything is done with the book, what's next? What's what's the next move for Lady O? Is it well, back? Well, you know, I am... Um, I'm, I, I'm honored to serve hand in hand with my husband in pastoral ministry. My husband is the pastor right. of Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church in Jacksonville. It's my honor to continue that work. That's the work that God has called me to do. You know, that's why I got ordained and went to seminary. And so I don't know that it's, that's what I'll do after. That's what I continue to do, because that is the call that God has on my life spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to anybody that will listen. Lastly, and then I'm going to let you go because I know you got a lot to do, and I appreciate you coming on the show. The last question I have for you really is just a very simple question. In your opinion, is Donald Trump and the rest of his cabinet, including DeVos and, and, and General Kelly and everybody else, do you believe that any of them are racist? Uh, that's a very simple yes. I've seen it for myself. And I unfortunately became uh, the poster child of uh, another African-American high-profile person that he called a racial slur in front of the world. The man called me a dog, a lowlife, wacky, all these things. If he's saying that in public, what is he saying in private? Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. If that's him being presidential publicly, what is he saying privately? But you have to look and judge people by their work, and we can see that they have not tried to help the community. They've only taken care of themselves with these tax cuts and by packing their pockets with all of the funds that they're diverting. And I think that that's the type of corruption that ultimately will come to light. One last question. Are you afraid for any backlash? Do you fear for you and your husband or family or anything like that? Because, you you know, according to him, he could shoot somebody in New York. Times Square, and they'll still support him. Well, Warren, you know me long enough. I, well, I told you people you a G. You, you, you a G. You ain't got no... I, I, <laughs> look, I told my, my cousin, said, was she afraid recording in the White House? I said, man, her theme song is I Ain't Never Scared. I said, that's her theme song. <laughs> I, <laughs> first of all, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, and so God didn't really give us the spirit of fear. If mm-hmm. you have faith, you can't have faith and fear in the same place. Either you're fearful or you have faith, and I have faith. The second thing is, if you see me in a fight with a bear, pray for the bear. <laughs> <laughs> we go in the interview right there. Look, go put up, pick up the book, Unhinged, <laughs> an insider's account of the Trump White House. Lady O, I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you. The book is fantastic. Like I said, even though I wasn't your friend, I would tell you that the book is a must read. Everybody pick the book up. And Lady O, we'll be talking soon. All right. Thank you so much, Warren. As always, I appreciate you so much. No worries. No worries. We'll talk soon. Have a safe trip. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. You're listening to the WB. We'll be right back.